Great to be with you. I, I, just before I jump into the message and what God's placed on my heart, I'd just love to show you some pictures from our trip to Alice Springs. Alice Springs was um, an outreach trip where we just wanted to build connections between uh, CFC Lefevre and CFC Alice Springs. The guys are going to show some pictures for me. Just keep the sound out. Just show the pictures. I'm going to talk as we go. The main purpose for me or what God placed on my heart for this trip was about building connections. We build, wanted to build connections between CFC Lefevre and CFC Alice Springs and to continue to establish that. We also uh, felt in the Lord that we wanted to build connections with the church up there with new people in the community and to build some new connections and also to reconnect and reestablish connections that were there in the past. And then ultimately we wanted to connect people who didn't know Jesus with Jesus Christ. So um, we had the wonderful privilege of, of doing that. But a couple of highlights uh, from Hidden Valley when the team were out there. Um, we were running a kids program and it was a chaotic kids program. Uh, we had lots of kids and um, there was lots of dogs and lots of other things going on at the time and noise everywhere. Uh, but in the midst of that, one of the families who lived very close to where we were said, could you come over and pray for us? Um, and Pastor Alan, who's my dad, went over with one of our team members, Zoe, and they went over and um, had an opportunity to pray for people in that house. And as they went there, they found a little child who had significant troubles with their digestive system, which um, was to the point that that child was being fed with a tube and there was problems going on and they were really, the doctor was saying, unless something changes, there's, a, there's significant trouble here for this child. So they prayed for that child. Um, and then they prayed for a lady who uh, struggled to get out of her bed. She made her way out of her bed to get into the front, to the front of the house to be prayed for. And she'd been diagnosed with lupus and that was having a significant impact on her ability to move and just to do anything. And uh, so they prayed and then, then left. And during the, the week that we were there, we were hearing some positive stories that maybe a miracle's taken place, maybe something's happened here. And then as, they, um, as dad went to the bank on Monday to deposit the tithes and offerings from the Sunday service, he saw one of the family members and they said, that child is up and running around and is uh, the digestive, eating properly, going to the toilet properly. Uh, a miracle has taken place. How awesome is that? And then they shared about the lady who could barely get out of bed uh, four or five days earlier, who now is up and moving around the house. So we're just believing that there's been a significant miracle for her as well. So that was a delight. That's one of our highlights. We had other miracles and other healings take place. But another one of the delights for me was at the men's breakfast to be able to uh, share the word and then have, have a man who had known Jesus in his early childhood, but had really made some choices that made a mess of his life and his marriage and his relationships. And he just sat there and said, I need Jesus because I want to change. I need help to change. I can't do this. Things are such a mess. Um, but it was able to lead him to Christ and um, just praying and believing for change in him to be able to, to get to church and see transformation. I don't know if his family situation is going to change because of the damage that's, that's, that's been done by him, but I'm um, just believing that uh, his soul and his life is going to have significant transformation. So um, we had some exciting things take place. It was a great team. I want to uh, honour both my mum and dad as well and ask you to continue to pray for them as they take on the role of leading the church there in the interim, uh, in that interim role. But it's been such a significant thing uh, for them to actually go and be up there and be part of the church just through this period of time. But also to honour uh, Malcolm Heffernan, who's made a, um, a significant commitment himself just to be a rock and a pillar in that church, an elder of the church and having his family come along and all that he does for the last 18, 19 years has been part of the church there in Alice Springs and uh, yes, to pray for him as well. And also for the other team members that are up there, just keep them in your prayers. But something great is happening and things are moving and good things are happening in um, Alice Springs. So if you're just happening to pass through Alice Springs at any time, drop in. Uh, there's a wonderful church there. Visit them, stay there for a while, um, and, but attend the church there. So that'd be fantastic if you could do that. Um, but as I share that, that brings me into what I want to share and God's placed on my heart this morning for for you as a group and for us as, a, as just for me personally, but for us this morning, um, is that I'm just inspired by both my mum and dad in their 70s, willing to pioneer and to initiate and to do something new in God. 
And we're talking about Mother's Day, but a mother is somebody who gives birth and gives birth to life, but they create, they, they, they pass on something. And I just see in my mum and dad at that, that age, at the age that they are, that they haven't said, oh, it's, that's the luxury of the young, dreaming, giving birth to new things, initiating, pioneering. That's for the young or for somebody else. But for them, they've said, no, this is, this is who we are. This is what we do. And I think it is for all of us to be people that are fresh, that there's new things happening, that we can initiate, we can pioneer. And that's really um, my encouragement to this morning, that each one of us would be pioneers, would be initiators, would be giving birth to new things in our life. That we wouldn't become stale and dry and stuck in one place or say, well, that's somebody else's job now. I've been doing it for a while and it's somebody else's problem or somebody else's job. But for each one of us would say, God, what have you got for me? What's fresh for me? What's new for me? What can I pioneer? What could I do? Um, whatever aspect of life that is for you. There's a few beautiful stories we're going to look at. And I don't think we talk about the ladies in the Bible enough. So this morning being Mother's Day, I'm going to share from some of the stories of the ladies in the Bible, um, particularly Old Testament ladies from the Old Testament. But the first one that I want to pick up is the story of a lady who made a choice that changed the rest of her life. And her name is Rahab. And you can read about her in Joshua. And um, her story is this, that she is faced with a choice and many of you who know your scriptures and read your Bible know her story and know what the outcome is, but for her, just take yourself back. She doesn't know what's going to happen. So she's faced with this choice. These two foreigners, these two strangers, these two people who have come into her city end up in her house and she has a choice about whether she will hand them over to her people or hide them and send them back to their, for what for us is our God, but for her was a foreign God to a foreign people, these people who were parked on her doorstep, who had struck fear into the lives of her city. She had a choice, would she hide them and send them back and hopefully get some favor with them? Or would she hide, not hide them, give them back to her people and end up getting fame and glory, but realize that she's actually giving them back to a society and a civilization that is crumbling and its foundations are crumbling and falling apart. The city that she was in, she could have had a moment of fame, a moment of being a hero, a moment of glory in her own city and amongst her own people, but she could see that that city, its foundations were about to fall apart. Although the building fell down and the, Jericho, the walls of Jericho fell down uh, sometime later, she already knew that the foundations of her society and what she knew were falling apart because she identified the fear and the anxiety and the trouble that was happening amongst her people. So in the midst of that uncertainty, she had a choice to make. Which way would she go? To a people that she does not know, to some gods, that, uh, God, sorry, God, I said gods, but a God that she does not know, or would she stay in her own customs and traditions in her own space? There's this moment in time where she has to make a choice. I don't know, have you ever missed a moment? Ever missed a moment in your life where you think, man, that was an important moment and I missed it. That was at a significant time and I let it, let it go. When I was, at Seton High School, I went to Seton High School and in grade eight we were playing cricket and I had a moment that could have changed my life. We were, there was a game of cricket going on and I'm part of that, I'm standing at gully, it's a very tense moment, the game is in the balance, it could go, we could win, we could lose um, and we brought our best bowler on and I'm standing there in gully and the batsman leans forward, the ball takes the edge, the ball flies to me. Um, and the next thing I remember is that I'm picking up the ball off the grass and throwing it back to the wicket keeper and the rest of my team are devastated. I had my moment. If I'd just taken that catch, maybe I could have been the next Ricky Ponting. Maybe that would have propelled me into a cricket career that I've just lost and just, just slipped through my fingers. But so often we have moments that slip through our fingers. We miss those opportunities. I definitely know I would have got from being 12th man or on the bench for our cricket team to maybe being playing a bit more regularly. But we miss moments, don't we? 
Sometimes we can, they can slip right through our fingers. A number of years ago, I was in the Philippines and um, I was sitting in, the, in a car with a businessman and he's quite a significant um, elder in one of the churches and quite a wealthy man, has a number of businesses. And he was looking at a thing called uh, Bitcoin, which I'd never heard of um, at that point in time. And he was saying, I bought these for a dollar and now they're a dollar, a dollar fifty. And he was pretty excited. And um, I had 150 bucks in my pocket and could have bought 100 of them. Moment went past just yesterday, I just for the sake of this sermon, I looked at how much are they worth. One Bitcoin is worth sorry, $51,000. Um, so I could have made a million dollars if I just, oh, sorry, half a million dollars if I just invested that 150 bucks that was in my pocket. Just a moment passed me by. How often do we miss moments? There was a house sold uh, just this, earlier this year over, um, over in the northern suburbs of Adelaide and uh, they were all, it was got to the news because the people who bought it a year earlier sold it for a million dollars more than they'd, um, they'd bought it for. And I'm thinking about the people who sold it a year, and a, half, a year earlier for 1.5 million, not 2.5 million and thinking, man, if I was in that situation, there's a million dollars that I've just let go in the space of a year. Um, I'm not a property investor or telling you to invest in cryptocurrency. That's, that's between you and your financial advisor. I'm just a pastor just saying the opportunities that have slipped through my fingers. Um, you work that out. But we miss opportunities, don't we? Things pass us by. Rahab is faced with an opportunity that is right there before her. For us, it's obvious because we know the end of the story. But for her, it's not so obvious. There's uncertainty, there's insecurity, there's a whole heap of questions going on. What decisions? would she make? There's another story of a widow in the Bible and we're gonna flick it up on the screen and um, please forgive me if I get Elisha and Elijah mixed up, I mix them up all the time but um, maybe you do, maybe you don't but um, the first widow we're gonna look at is Elisha and um, this widow, she initiates. There's a moment, there's something going on in her life and because of her movements and her actions and the choices that she makes, she creates a new future, she creates something, she initiates something and gives birth to something in her life because she takes action. Let me just read you the first verse of this story. It says, one day a widow of a member of the group of prophets came to Elisha and cried out, my husband who served you is dead and you know how he feared the Lord. But now a creditor has come, threatening to take my two sons as slaves. So she's faced with devastation now. Her husband was a, a prophet, served Elisha, loved him, uh, worked with him, gave, his, gave her life for ministry, uh, and now she's ended, he's passed away, and now she's ended up at a place of financially desperate. She's stuck in that place. Um, but instead of just giving up and saying, well, so be it, my sons will be taken from me, I can't do anything, she says, no, I'm gonna take action. I'm gonna make a choice and move towards. I'm gonna to move forward. So this widow with boldness and courage goes to Elisha. She doesn't know what response she's gonna get, but she musters up this boldness, this courage, this in, initiates something, pioneers and sort of says, I'm gonna move forward. I'm not happy with how things are. I'm gonna try and create a different future than my son's being sold into slavery. For you and me, that idea of someone having a debt and them being sold into slavery here in Australia, we just think that's so far from our lives. But in India, um, still today, the men who, who make bricks, or families that make bricks, they have these little kilns and they're scattered across the countryside. But as they make those bricks, it's people working to pay off a debt to the owner. And they get into a situation where they set it up and it's set up in such a way that that, that person is so on the brink of poverty all the time that if there's a health issue or anything else happens in their life, they need to borrow money from their master or the, the owner that keeps them in debt and they just end up in this lifetime of paying off a debt that they can never pay off to the point that then the, the owners then say, well, your children have to now pay off your debt. So the children are then trapped there for generation after generation. There is no hope, there is no way out for them. This lady said, well, I don't want that for my children, I don't want my children to end up in that place. So she, with boldness and courage, she steps out and boldness and courage, she creates a new future for her family. And the story goes that um, Elisha says, well, what have you got? 
What have you got in your hand? What have you got with you? And he says, well, nothing but just a little jar of oil. So the prophet says, well, take that jar of oil, go and collect up as many jars as you can and fill them up from there. Strange idea that a container this big is going to fill up all these other things. But she, she goes, what would you do when you were to- if you were told to do that? We all know the outcome of the story, so we're all people of faith. So it's like, yeah, of course, I would have got as many jars as possible. That's how, what we say because we know the story. But how crazy would you feel going and sending your son out and going to your neighbours, asking them for a jar to fill up from a little jar that you're gonna pour in more than is actually in the jar? It's a bit bizarre, really. Like, it's odd. But by faith and out of obedience to the prophet, and the prophets in the Old Testament really are, represent God, and they speak God's word, and they are really the word of God to her. So the word of God spoke to her through the prophet and said, this is how I'm going to provide for you. This is how, by your boldness and your faith, this is the way out for you and your family. You need to obey. So she makes that choice. She goes and she starts filling and then she tells the sons, this is working, go and get more jars. So they bring all the jars from everyone they can find until the point that there's no more jars. And she's saying, bring more jars. And she says, mom, there's no more left. And then the oil stopped pouring out. Isn't that amazing? And then the prophet says to her, just sell those oil, sell the oil pay off your debt and live on the rest. But because of her boldness and faith, she created a new future. She gave birth to a life and a future that was there for her that wasn't there before. You know, the future belongs to the bold. The future belongs. There's a future there for those who are willing to create and step out and move forward by faith. Whatever that is for you. There's another story of a widow And she's not like this other lady. She doesn't create, she doesn't go to the prophet. She's not initiating. She's actually resigned herself to the fact that she's going to die and her son is going to die. And um, the prophet Elijah Elijah comes to her. Let me stay with me. The prophet Elijah comes to her because he's, well, he's created her problem really because he said years before there will be no rain and there'll be no dew on the ground Uh, again until I speak a word. So he spoke that and it happened. Now this lady ends up in poverty uh, because there's no food, there's a famine going on. And then Elijah for all, he's during this famine, he's at the brook by the water's edge and the ravens and the birds are bringing him food, bread and meat, more bread. Sounds like a beautiful hamburger that's being brought to him every day. The birds are bringing in these hamburgers, delicious. Um, if, it was a, if you're a vegetarian, it would have been a vegan burger. Um, but he's bringing in this food for them, and then the water runs out, and God says, well, go, go to this widow. I've prepared her. But when we hit, meet her, she doesn't look like she's actually that prepared. That God had, they don't look like, and doesn't sound like God's actually spoken to her. But he turns up to her and says, well, what are you doing? And she says, well, I'm collecting sticks and I've got a little bit of flour and a bit of oil and I'm going home to eat my last meal and then I'm going to die with my son. She'd come to that place. But in the midst of that, God comes in through a prophet and brings an opportunity for her in her fears and her doubts to make a choice that changed her life. Maybe we'll stick the verse up and I'll read it, guys. The one, have you got the one Kings verse? Yeah, one Kings 17. But Elisha, this is Elisha's action, oh, interaction with her. It says, Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. So obviously there's fear and doubt and concern for her. Don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you've said. But make a little bread for me first. That's a bit outrageous, isn't it? Go ahead and do what you're going to do. Go home, take your bread. This is me just thinking. This is what I think she's hearing. His, go home, make your bread, cook your thing, but before you cook yours and die uh, with your son, cook me something first. I mean, don't, do you not see that in that passage? I think, man, what is this lady going through? What, she's got fears and doubts, and then this man who's a man of God, she doesn't know him, doesn't necessarily have a relationship with him, and he's telling her, feed me first before you go and feed yourself and die. 
not all the prophets and not all the, um, the priests of the Old Testament were good men. So is he a bad man? And what is going on there? There would have been all these questions going through her mind of what, what choice will she make? Will she obey? Will she follow? Will she not? Then he gives her a promise. This probably builds her spirits up a bit more. So this is what the Lord says. The God of Israel said, there will always be flour and oil left in your containers until the, can we go to the next slide? Until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. And the Lord sending rain and the crops going again are dependent on Elijah himself and his word. But is she going to follow the word of God for her life, the promise for her life? Will she overcome her doubts and her fears and her insecurities to step into and create a future for herself? Sometimes for us, our doubts and our fears, they hold us back from stepping in to what God has for us, to giving birth or creating or initiating or pioneering that thing that the Lord would say for us. Whether that's something in our families, whether that's in our health, whether it's business and you're an entrepreneur and a business person or a musician, whatever that is for you, it's different for each one of us. But would we step in, overcoming our doubts and our fears? This lady, through her choice, has positioned herself for an even greater miracle to take place in her life. The story goes on that um, Elijah then stays with her and um, eats with, stays in her house and eats and feeds them. We're not told how long, but he stays there and feeds and they, the, the, the container continues to produce flour and oil and they have meals together. Uh, and this goes on for some time, the scriptures tell us. But then we're told that her child, her son, dies. And her response is the same response as the, uh, the people of Israel when they were coming out of exile. Her response is, well, they said to Moses, Moses, did you bring us out here to die? Like, why did you bring us out into the desert? God brought us out here, you brought us out here. Did you bring us out here just to inflict more suffering and sorrow and pain and trouble upon us? They could see the Pharaoh's army, they could see this army coming towards them and they thought death was what awaited them and said, we could have just died in Egypt. Why didn't we stay there? This lady's response is, well, to the prophet, well, why did you do this? You saved my life, you rescued me and my son, but now look what's happened. But by that choice of obeying the prophet and obeying the word and being bold and courageous, it positioned her now in a place for another miracle to take place. It positioned her to, for another future where she takes the, the son and the prophet prays for the son and he's healed and restored and the son comes back to life. But because of those first choices, it positioned her in a place to receive and be there to, to see this other miracle take place. Well, let's go back to Rahab. She's in a position, she has a choice to make and the choice that she makes really does impact her future. She makes a choice, not to stay with her own, but to go to the uncertain, unfamiliar, not sure how she'll be fully received, but she steps out in that. So Rahab, she pioneered a new life in uncertain times. There was uncertainty for her, there was insecurity for her. She didn't know this foreign God, she didn't know these foreigners, she didn't know what was there for her, but she saw something and was willing to move towards those people. She put her trust in their hands. So the story tell, the, the prophets, oh sorry, the spies told her, <coughs> when we attack, put a, a scarlet cloth in your window and bring whoever is in your house will be rescued and saved. We will not harm them. So she trusted their word with uncertainty, insecurity, not sure what was going to happen, but she trusted their word and move that way. So she didn't go and get all the men that she'd, she's a prostitute, so she didn't go and get all those men in. She went and got her mum and her dad and her family members and brought them into that space. She rescued them and saved them, probably bringing, bringing them into her shame, that place where she'd had many men visit her over the years. But instead of that, she pushed that out and said, no, I'm gonna bring my family into this place and brings them in. And the story goes on that the family are rescued, the family are saved. But she pioneered a new life for her family. 
And as she joined into the Israelite tribe and people and worshipped their God, there was amazing change took place. Her very nature that she had, she set up a new nature and a new character for, for her family. She marries and her son is Boaz. Those of you who know the story of Ruth will know the story of Boaz. But Ruth, uh, sorry, but Rahab took a fair, like her character, her issues of life, the problems that she was going through that drove her into prostitution. I don't know what they are, but you don't end up there without there being some level of dysfunction and choice and trouble going on. She takes that, but the choices that she makes transform, is transformed into having a son who's a man of dignity and honor and integrity and in character. If you read the story of Ruth, Ruth and Naomi basically cook up a plan to say, Ruth, go and lie at Boaz's feet. And Boaz had an opportunity there basically to take Ruth as his wife um, and take advantage of another foreigner from another nation and actually join himself with her, but take advantage of her and make him his wife. But he said, no, I'm going to do this the right way. I'm going to do this with dignity. I'm going to do this with integrity. I'm going to do it the way that God says. I'm going to set this up. So he's a man of integrity. He could have bypassed and shortcut the system to take Ruth for himself at any point in the story. But he refused to do that. So a family that was tracking for trouble. Ruth that was heading, sorry, Rahab that was heading in a a place of destruction had the opportunity then to be transformed into a family of dignity, a son that stands with boldness. So much so that two, two generations on, that Boaz is the great, great grandfather of King David. And then we know for King David is the line of Jesus Christ. So Rahab in her choice of stepping into uncertainty, into something so unfamiliar, went from being certain destruction and death to actually becoming part of the line of Jesus Christ that brings salvation to all mankind. What a transformation. But she positioned herself, she made a choice. She didn't miss her moment. The ball could have just gone through her hand. She could have said, no, well, I'll just turn these guys over to my people. And her life would have crumbled with everybody else. She made a choice. We all face moments to choose. And maybe you think, oh man, my faith is not that strong. I've missed opportunities. Things have come. I'm not here to make you feel bad. I'm here to stir you to say, oh, what is God doing now? We can't live in the past. We can't live with the regrets. We can't live back there. But what is God doing now for us? Rahab could, wouldn't have been able to connect all those dots to say, well, if I do make this choice, then this will happen, then this will happen, and then I'll end up being in the line of Jesus. She couldn't have cooked all that up. We can't put the dots together. Who would have thought, 50-something years ago, when my mum and dad went to Ernabella, um, they had jobs, careers, they left all of that, and they went as missionaries to Central Australia. Uh, who would have thought that choice right back then there's so been so many dots that have happened that have actually linked into a church being in Alice Springs. But then now, years, over five decades later, they're still pioneering and birthing and believing for things and ministering to people in Alice Springs. They couldn't have put those dots together. Who would have put the dot that our family coming from um, Ernabella and living at just across the road at Grange and then coming to this church and what God's done through that. Those dots, we can't put all the dots together. We look at them in hindsight and see the dots and the things that God is doing, but there's moments in time when we get to make choices that allow us to join all those dots together and then we see, God, you, man, God, you've been at work. I'm sure Rahab, sitting in heaven, will just be blown away by what God did through that choice that she made to align herself in uncertainty and doubts to actually join this tribe, this group of people that were sitting at her doorstep. Let's have a look at one last scripture. It's Hebrews 12. It just talks about Jesus. It talks about keeping our eyes on Jesus, who is the champion who initiates and perfects your faith. Maybe you're saying, man, I can't. I don't have that type of faith. But Jesus initiates faith. 
He pioneers faith in you. And obviously that's the first step of that faith is faith to believe in Jesus Christ and him as the savior of the world to forgive us of our sins. But he keeps pioneering. He keeps initiating faith in you. He keeps working in you. And that doesn't stop. What is Jesus working in you? What's he initiating in you? What's he pioneering you at this point in time for something for tomorrow? And the NIV translation of that says that Jesus is the, the pioneer and perfecter, I think it is. We'll just flick that up, guys. Yeah, that Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. The pioneer and perfecter of faith in you. Maybe you think, oh, my faith's not that strong. Maybe there's some things there you think, oh, man, I've had a dream. I've had a desire, but I've let it go. Or you just, today you're being stirred to step out into something. Well, let me tell you, you're in Jesus. And the very nature of Jesus Christ is in you as a child of God. So his nature is our nature. So that we, we become pioneers. We become pioneers of faith. People who step out, knowing that he is at work pushing us in that direction. So I want to encourage you. It's Mother's Day. But also, what are you going to mother? What are you going to give birth to? What is there for you that you're saying, God, you're doing this in me that you're going to initiate and pioneer something fresh in you? We're not made to stay the same. We're not made just to settle. God's made us to be people who initiate, who step out, who dream his dream, and we respond in obedience, respond to his word. Let's pray together. Jesus, I just thank you for each and every person in this room and also for those who are online. Jesus, I just pray that you, by your, your Holy Spirit, would breathe a breath of freshness into us, that you would breathe your dreams and your faith and your courage and your boldness, that we would be people who are willing to step out, that we can look back in life and look back and say, oh, that decision, that decision, those things, God, you're at work putting the dots together, but I didn't miss the moments that you've put before me. Jesus, I pray for each one of us. But it would be a daily thing that we would look for those opportunities that you've put before us to reach out, to share faith, to respond to you and your breath, to respond to you and your word, to create a future, to create something that doesn't exist now through the choices that we make today. Amen. Just as we get ready to sing sing a song just want to encourage you my sister a number of years ago had her house painted and Dan Huber went and painted that house but Dan responded he moved from her house to the unit across the road across the the driveway and knocked on a door and started to talk to a lady and um, spoke to her and then she came to the Friday service and she came to faith. But Dan, just making that little decision to step out, to talk to somebody, brought something, changed a person's life. And now she's a regular part of our church because she was willing to step out. Jesus changes lives. I encourage you, where are you at with moving towards Jesus? You need to move towards him. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, the, the very first step of faith really is to, to stake it, take a step towards him. Like Rahab, she had to step into this tribe, into this group that she did not understand, towards this God that she didn't fully know everything about, but she was willing to make that decision. If you're watching online or you're here today and you've not made that decision to step towards Jesus Christ, I encourage you to do that. So yeah, I need Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I want to want to step towards you. It will change your life forever. It will transform you. You'll be changed and brought into a whole new sphere of things that you've never experienced before. It's radical. But I encourage you, if you've not done that or if you've let that faith in Jesus drop off, make a choice today to say, yeah, Jesus, I need you. I'm going to say a short prayer. I encourage you to say it. Uh, after me it's not everything you need to say it's not all that you'll need to pray and all that you'll need to know but it's that first step if you're online you can also say this prayer after me as well if you're here in the room just pray it in your breath uh, under your breath or in your mind and Jesus will hear that I'm going to pray let's all bow our heads and just respect this moment if this is you you just join me in this prayer Jesus I need you Jesus I choose you 
Jesus, I don't want this moment to miss me. I don't want this moment to pass me by. Jesus, I choose you and your family and I want to be joined to you. I don't understand everything, but I'm moving towards you. Take my life. Change me. I want to follow you. Amen. If you've said that prayer, that's not Thank you for joining us today. If you made a commitment of your life to Jesus and you've personally received him, please make contact with us as we would love to help you understand more about who Jesus is and what he's done and the marvellous plans he has for your life. In fact, I would encourage you to read one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the beginning of the New Testament, and discover for yourself the wonder of, of his words and the incredible encouragement he was to so many people when he walked this earth and he can be and will be for you. If uh, you would like to make contact with any of our pastors or attend any of our services, you're, you're most welcome uh, at uh, our Seton campus. Until we meet again next week, every blessing on you.